there are exactly 16 optimally bad games of tic-tac-toe. So I wasn't gonna make another tic-tac-toe video, but then the other day I was playing again with my three-year-old son and I realized that I was using a very particular strategy, which I think other parents will be familiar with. See, he's just learning, so I wanted him to win sometimes, but I also wanted him to get a sense for the experience of competition. So if I had a winning move, I would take it. And if he had a winning move, I would block it. But aside from that, I wanted to play as badly as possible to give him ample opportunity to win. I did my best, but when I got home, you know I had to write a computer program to make the whole thing a little more systematic. Here's how I went about it. First, I made an exhaustive dictionary of the 256,128 possible games of tic-tac-toe and their outcomes. Each entry in the dictionary consisted of a sequence of move numbers, based on this numbering scheme, followed by a value that encodes the outcome of the game. A value of 1 means that X, or player 1, wins. A value of negative 1 means that O wins, and a value of 0 means that it's a draw. Now, before we go on, I have to address the topic of symmetry. See, in my previous tic-tac-toe videos, I made a point of counting symmetrical games as the same game, but in this case, I thought that might distort things a little. Take this position, for example. A skilled player would look at this and see that there are really two possible responses for O, one of the corners, or one of the edges. Due to symmetry, both corners are essentially the same, and all four edges are essentially the same. If O responds in one of the edges, it's destined to be a cat's game, with the players taking turns blocking each other's winning moves. On the other hand, if O responds with one of the inviting corner positions, they're destined to lose, because X will surely respond in the opposite corner and create a fork. So how do we evaluate the state of this position for the two players? Well, it depends on the quality of O as a player. Again, let's let 1 represent X winning the game, negative 1 represent O winning, and 0 represent a tie. If O is a perfect player, they will avoid the trap, and a draw is essentially guaranteed. So the expected value of the position is 0. On the other hand, if O is skilled enough to recognize the underlying symmetry, but doesn't think strategically beyond that, the expected value is positive 1 half, since they're selecting between two possibilities, edge or corner, one of which is a draw, and the other of which is a victory for X. Funnily enough, though, if O is selecting their next move completely randomly and with no understanding of the symmetry of the position, the expected value of the position is one-third, since there are four edges that will lead to a draw and only two corners that will lead to X winning. Anyway, I don't know how many three-year-olds you've played tic-tac-toe against recently, but in my experience, they are much more like this third player. And so, in my exhaustive dictionary of all possible tic-tac-toe games and their outcomes, I did not reduce the space of possible games based on symmetry. Anyway, back to my computer program, the algorithm hinged on evaluating board positions by averaging the result of every possible completion of the game from that point on. Take this board position, for example, with four moves left to go. There are 21 different possible ways that this game can play out. 11 of them are victories for X, which have a score of 1, 6 of them are victories for O, which have a score of negative 1, and 4 of them are draws, which have a score of 0. Taking a weighted average of these scores, we get a value of 5 over 21, or roughly 0.238 for this board position, indicating that it's somewhat advantageous for X. By the way, there's actually something subtly wrong about my reasoning here, which I ultimately had to correct. Can you spot it? We'll come back to it in a moment. Anyway, now that we have a way of evaluating board positions, all we have to do to play as badly as possible is select the move that results in the best possible board position for the other player which is to say the move that gives them the most paths to victory, and us the fewest. So let's take a look at a game I played with my three-year-old and see how this algorithm works in action. I played as X, going first, which is a significant advantage, as you can see by the expected value of 0.297 for the empty board. My goal was to lower this value, pushing it as negative as possible, since a negative value indicates more positive outcomes for O, my three-year-old son. The best I could do on this first move was to lower the expected value to 0.2 by choosing an edge, and so that's what I did. My son responded with an adjacent edge. Not technically the worst possible move, but pretty darn close. In response, I once again chose the move with the lowest possible score, the right edge. This got the expected value down to 0.172. Still an advantage for me, but we're making progress. At this point, my son spotted that I was on the verge of winning and blocked me with the center square. I was pumped. This reduced the expected value down to negative 0.367. Finally, he had the upper hand. Now, of course, he had two in a row at this point, and I could have just let him win. But what kind of a life lesson does that impart? I needed to teach him that sometimes the world is cold and hard. 
so I blocked his winning move. At this point, to my delight, my son chose the upper right corner, um. a fork. I, of course, blocked one of his winning moves, but he saw the other one and won. As a gleeful smile came across his face, I reflected on the fact that all of my poor play in the early game set him up for this joyful opportunity. I had truly triumphed, by which I mean I lost. Now, it didn't always go down this way. Here's another game, this time in which he went first. He started in the upper edge, wow. and I responded with the opposite edge, yielding an expected value of 0.37. Um. Remember, I wanted the numbers to be more positive this time, since he was playing as X. Next, he chose the highly respectable upper right-hand corner. Wow. I blocked it, of course, um. since I wasn't just going to let him win, but things were still looking up for him. Until, that is, he chose the middle square. Wow. Since I can't let him win, I have to block him in the lower left-hand corner. Um. But alas, in doing so, I forced him into a fork and couldn't help but win the game. In the end, I played 16 games with my son, of which he won seven, I won five despite my best efforts, and we tied four times. Thus, an empirical estimate for the expected value of playing against my three-year-old son with my optimal losing strategy is one-eighth, indicating a slight weighting in his favor. This, frankly, is perfect. He gets to experience both winning and losing, but enjoys the fact that he wins a little more than he loses. He also experiences a few draws, which, while boring, prepare him well for the higher echelons of tic-tac-toe competition. So remember I mentioned earlier that there was a mistake in my calculation for the expected value of a board position? Here's the problem. Say that we're in this position, with three moves left in the game, considering all the options before us. We can represent these options as a tree, accounting for every possible next move by X, response by O, and final move by X. Now, my initial approach was to just look at all the results and average out their values. Three wins by X divided by five total outcomes yields an expected value of 0.6. But let's think again about what it means to play uniformly randomly. If every move is equally likely, then each of X's first moves has a probability of one-third. In response, O will always have two choices, each of which has a probability of one-half. And then the final move by X only has one choice, with probability one. Multiplying these probabilities out, we get a probability of one-sixth for each of the outcomes at the bottom, but one-third for the outcome in which X plays the winning move right away. Adding together the branches in which X wins, we get a probability of two-thirds, or 0.666 repeating, slightly higher than the 0.6 we got earlier. The basic issue is that, because some games end early, uniformly random play does not correspond to uniformly random outcomes. So in my code, I had to adjust the weighting somewhat to get the final board position values you've seen in this video. Glad we got that sorted out. Well, actually, I did think of another oversight here in my quest for optimal badness. It has to do with an assumption about how I myself will play as the game unfolds. Can you figure out what it is? I'll pin the first comment that points out the issue. One last thing. Just for fun, I decided to try playing two of my optimally bad tic-tac-toe players against each other. Now, often there was more than one equally bad choice. For example, at the beginning, any edge is equally bad. So I mapped out all the possible worst games and came up with a number. There are exactly 16 optimally bad games of tic-tac-toe. Now, this number is actually double counting symmetrical games. If you reduce by symmetry, there are only two different optimally bad games of tic-tac-toe, and even those are practically the same. I should say, by the way, that the concept of playing this strategy against itself is pretty flawed. The assumption in this video was that we were playing against a three-year-old, who we've modeled as a random player. But if you're playing against someone who's also trying to lose, we're entering the territory of a variant called Miserere tic-tac-toe, for which you'd probably want to use something like a minimax algorithm, as I talked about in my second video. Still, you have to admit, this is some pretty bad tic-tac-toe playing. By the way, if you want to try out my tic-tac-toe expected value game for yourself, I'm throwing it up on Patreon, along with the code I used to write it. I'm making the post free, but if you're able to sign up for a paid tier, it would really help me out, and you get access to some other cool stuff. Now, I know that becoming a patron isn't for everyone, but the good news is that that's not the only way you can support my channel. Because if you're the kind of person who spent 10 minutes watching me describe in detail how to build a computer program to lose at tic-tac-toe, you're gonna love Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. 
Brilliant is the perfect platform for tinkerers, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, coding, and AI crafted by an award-winning team from places like MIT and Google. If you enjoy dissecting games like I did in this video, you'll love the way that their courses are filled with little puzzles to solve, which help you master the content in a fun, engaging way. They've also managed to break up complex topics into short, convenient lessons to help you establish a daily learning habit. You know, watching a video like this is a great way to create a kind of reference or pointer to knowledge. You know an idea is out there, but it doesn't really live inside of you. There's obviously value to this, but in my experience, real creativity comes from engaging with and truly internalizing knowledge. To try Brilliant for free for a full 30 days and get 20% off an annual premium subscription, visit brilliant.org slash Mark Evanstein or click the link in the description. Just checking it out supports my channel, and I bet you'll love what you discover.